Thank you for tuning in to the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's March 2023, and this is episode 329, which is a conversation in our literary apologetics series about the work of the American poet Mary Oliver. On this episode, I'm joined by Stephen Mitchell. He is a writer, and he teaches English in North Carolina. He also holds a PhD in humanities. Stephen has written an online exclusive feature article for the Christian Research Journal. His article is called Christ or Lucretius, Nature and Nature's God in the Poems of Mary Oliver. And our subscribers can read his article for free at our website, equip.org. If you would like to read his article and all of our online exclusive articles, if you don't already subscribe, head on over to equip.org to subscribe. Stephen, it's good to have you on the podcast again. Thank you, Melanie. It's good to be here. Well, today, as I mentioned, we're talking about the American poet Mary Oliver, the late Mary Oliver, actually, and not a lot of Listeners might have heard of her before or be familiar with her work, and she is a celebrated poet. And I think these things are important for cultural apologetics and just how we think about different subjects and how we can talk to people and use them as a springboard as people are considering the existence of God. So tell us a little bit about Mary Oliver. What kind of poet was she? And as I noted, the importance of literature and poetry, what makes her poetry in particular important? Okay. So Mary Oliver, uh, an American poet, um, she won the Pulitzer Prize for her collection called American Primitive. I believe that was in the 70s, maybe early 80s. I'm, I'll, you'd have to recheck the date as to when she won that. She is... Arguably, I would say probably we would class her as a nature poet. In many ways, she, with some difference, of course, but she picks up the the American Romantic tradition from the 19th century. Uh, she, in fact, identifies many of the American Romantics as kind of kindred spirits to her and and poets and writers who have really shaped her her view of the world from uh, Walt Whitman to Edgar Allan Poe um, are just two particular voices. She's a free verse poet, so her her poetry works primarily. Um, it's meditative, it's reflective, it's observational. Often it moves by associations of images and things like that. One of the things that I think makes her poetry important is that Though it's not overtly religious, Mary Oliver's relation to formal religion is is, is ambiguous. Um, she, even in the very last years of her life, expressed, um, you know, her real sort of doubt about the realities of the Christian doctrine of the resurrection. Her sexual life was not orthodox. She is, of course, uh, a, a lesbian with a with a lifelong partner. So. In the sense in which perhaps Orthodox Christians would think of it, she was not religious, though there's some evidence that maybe toward the end of her life that she returned to at least the Episcopal Church and to considering you know, her spiritual life through those disciplines. But she does, I think, two things that make her important as a modern poet, as a contemporary, really a contemporary poet. She just died about three years ago, something like that, three or four years ago. And one of those is that in a world that is quickly you know, the the growth of cities and the, you know, the mass development of technologies and things, she remains attentive to the small and vulnerable things of the natural world, aware of them, attentive to them, and able to see and to speak their value. And so she offers that counterpoint to, 
you know, the fast urban lives that, you know, seem more and more to be the norm of uh, that humans live in this world. And the second is that by way of her attentiveness to the natural world, she is quite open in principle to the reality of, of the spiritual world. She is not terribly certain about its whole nature, but she is quite certain that there is a, a spiritual realm. And just keeping that idea open in an age where it is in a time when it's perhaps being lost and easy to be lost, you know, that makes her, I think, in many ways important. I think she's important for the very, very, and, and this is kind of extraordinary, the very slow way that she has lived, giving, you know, entire days to quiet contemplation of a tree <laughs> or a bird or a nest of birds, doing so with the confidence, a confidence that is rewarded, as we see in her poetry, that in those small creatures and beings and in those small things, there is, there is something to feed our minds, to feed our souls, to feed our spirits. There's something there. And Again, as a counter, I suppose, to the swiftness with which we live, the tendency in the modern world is to live, her attentiveness can draw us back away from that. And so I, I find her important for that reason and for the openness that she maintains to uh, the realities of the spiritual life in the spiritual world. I think it's important for our readers to consider different works by various authors like we do when we talk about films and television series and other influences like artistic influences on our culture, because it's through those things these days that a lot of non-Christians start to think about spiritual things. Now, mm -hmm. I do want to point out that she won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 1984, and she's also been awarded a several, four, I guess, honorary doctorates. So she's won a lot of awards and mm -hmm. been noted as a very important thinker and poet and writer. And so what in particular, you mentioned she would contemplate a tree or mm -hmm. just look out and, and look at nature in a slow fashion, which today is not something that we do, especially if you think of how much people scroll on their phones through mm -hmm. social media, or it might not mm -hmm. even be social media. It might be your favorite news site or whatever. Mm -hmm. So what makes her particularly important to a conversation about nature and contemplation and spiritual life? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that part of what she, she offers one is an ability to see these these beings, these creatures, whether it be, you know, a, a bush of roses or whether it be um, a fox that she sees in the woods or whether it's a snake or a fish, she's able to see them for what they are. She's able to see the difference between herself as a person and this creature. And then she is able to allow that difference to awaken questions in her own heart about who she is, you know, about the kind of thing that she is, the kind of being that she is, and, and by, by extension, the kind of being a human is. In one of my favorite of her poems, Rose's Late Summer, she talks about the fearlessness of the rose, their willing consent to be exactly what they are. She talks about uh, the fact that they, they don't worry about you know, what's going to come next or how long they're going to be alive, uh, what they're going to be after they pass, if anything. And, and some of this, of course, is, you know, it's anthropomorphizing. Some of it is projection. But, but what she becomes aware of in herself, right, is a desire to be at peace and content. And of course, a human being is not a rose, right? We have a consciousness that a rose doesn't have. And any hope we have at arriving at perfect contentment and peace is going to be a journey. But the way she meditates 
allows, I think, allows her to become aware of what is disrupted, right, inside of her, aware that she has a spirit and all is perhaps not perfectly well with it. So I think she's really important in that sense, that the difference between the contentment of the creatures of the world or the natural world and her own discontent leads to some introspection and, and, and to spiritual reflection. Um, I think, though, also she's important because she models and she articulates how gratitude, this sense of wonder, um, a certain just open-hearted love for what is, right? How that, if cultivated, it leads to sort of deeper and richer spiritual reflections. And there's not a perfect cause and effect. It's, it's really not possible to say, well, you know, because Mary Oliver was a slow contemplative observer of the natural world, she therefore grew to love it and had great gratitude for it and could conceive that there was some sort of, you know, being overseen at all. It's not necessarily that clear, but that ability to love and that willingness to be still and that sort of open-hearted acceptance of what is rather than a grasping after what one does not have, a kind of avariciousness, the lack of that avariciousness in her, gives her just a deep, just a very deep spirituality. And I think out of her poetry arises this, just this sense of deep pleasure and deep joy in the privilege of living in this world. And that's not naive. Mary Oliver, you know, she suffered considerable things in her life. She saw how the natural world, you know, death is a significant part of it. And all of that folds into her reflections. But nonetheless, she is able to be a kind of example of how still thankful attentiveness opens us to a sense of something higher and richer and better. I want to thank you because you listen regularly to the Postmodern Realities podcast. And if you haven't already, I know you've heard me say a lot, but we would be so grateful if you would partner with us and just take a few minutes of your time and just write us a review on Apple Podcasts. Now, it's been almost six months. I can't believe it. September 2022 was the last time someone wrote a review for us about the podcast. It only takes a few minutes. Just go on over to Apple Podcasts, and it really helps us out because the more ratings and reviews that we have, it's just the way the algorithm works on the internet. It will show this content to more people who can discover just ways in which they can be equipped as Christians about cultural apologetics, something like literary apologetics, like what we're discussing today with the work of Mary Oliver, and also just different ways they can think thoughtfully about different movements in the church, or even just theological subjects that help you grow in your union with Christ. So we hope you would help us to introduce this podcast to more people. Now, if you're not already a subscriber, we'd ask that you partner with us by subscribing. You can do that for 3350 at our website, equip.org. And as always, if a subscription is not in your budget, just head on over to equip.org and click on journal and click on Postmodern Realities Podcast and at any landing page, there's a way that you can give us a tip. Anything helps, every amount helps. And so we're grateful for the ways that you partner with us. And we're grateful if you're a subscriber and we just ask that you would help us out and let more people know about us by frankly, just simply telling your friend. Now back to our conversation with Stephen Mitchell. So how does Mary Oliver look at the natural world? I mean, how does she approach it? And does her particular approach to nature affect what she sees? Yeah. So I'll try to answer this without repeating what I've said already. So she talks about, for example, um, w one of the things that we, we should know about Mary Oliver is that uh, as a child, uh, the woods, uh, not so much, she, she grew up in rural Ohio, um, and she grew up in a home where there was deep, pretty deep and awful abuse 
uh, that she suffered in her home. And as a way to escape that, if even for a time, she would spend a lot of time just in the woods. So very early in her life, the woods were a sanctuary for her. She talks about how she would build little, even little tiny shelters in the woods and sort of get inside them and just look out. And so the natural world, the woods, the forest, these places as a safe space were, is important to, I think, the formation of her, of her person, of her soul, of her view um, of the world. I think there's no getting around the fact that Mary Oliver is just temperamentally sensitive and temperamentally quiet and temperamentally slow. These are just gifts of her being. But she also cultivated those things. So that slowness, uh, that attentiveness, that that kind of sensitive willingness to let the world reveal itself to her allows her to see it in ways that maybe we would not otherwise. So here's an example. Um, She has another uh, lovely poem, and the particular name of this one is Escaping Me, but she's talking about how she... uh, cupped a pipe, a little pipe fish in her hand one time out of a pond. And she reflects on the way it struggled to get free. And, you know, this becomes for her a sense of every being's own integrity and its desire to keep its life and the, and the value of being alive that that suggests. But she says in that poem, it wanted to get free. I'm paraphrasing her. And I opened my hand like a promise that I would keep my whole life and have and let it go. And I think that, that right there, that willingness to let a thing go, to not need to grasp and hold and possess and own and control, that stance allows the natural world to show itself to her in a way that wouldn't otherwise be. And here's another example of that that is Again, it's, it's extraordinary. She records a time when she went out very early in the morning into the woods and just sat down against a tree and was there for a long time watching. And she was particularly, after a while, was watching two young doe. And she was so still and so kind of non-aggressive that they got close enough to her that one of them touched her with its nose. Like they came up to see her and you know, and explore what she was. And she says something in the end of her home, like, and and what more could life give me than this gift? You know, her own sense that this deer, you know, these animals that are, they are prey animals and they're fearful of everything that it could trust her enough. And this is a wild deer to touch her with its nose. That takes an extraordinary kind of person, someone whose anxiety and angstiness is, you know, way out of sight. And so that, you know, what she sees, what she sees are beings that have an integrity to them, whether it's a tiny little pipe fish or it's a dog, but they have an integrity to them that she honors. And in honoring it, I think she becomes aware of the profundity of the created world that the material world has like an ontological texture is I guess what I would say. And she's able to convey that at a level that, that is just, I think, unsurpassed. There are many other extraordinary poets of the natural world, but, but hers is unsurpassed in that way. And, and it's because of that hands off, let the world be what it is and let me just be in it, watching it, and reflecting on it, let it speak to me what it can speak, that she not only comes to honor and love it, but to kind of almost like an icon, see through it a world of spirit that is alluring, you know, but of course still mysterious and and ambiguous. So that's how I would answer that question. You just mentioned the world of spirit. So how does she relate the natural world to spiritual realities? Because I know she's been noted for that. 
Mm-hmm. When people have asked her about, you mentioned briefly, you know, just her views kind of on Christianity, but she's talked about in interviews, her curiosity maybe about God. Yep. And so, you know, how can some of that, of her curiosity be related to how she sees the natural world, I guess? Yeah, I think the way I would answer that is that the wonder that the natural world arouses in her, she says in her poem, Messenger, my work is mostly standing still and learning to be astonished. It's probably my favorite line by her, as much as I love her. Standing still, right, one place, repeated over and over again. Learning, right, which we would normally separate from astonishment because we tend to think of astonishment as a kind of momentary sort of spark of the unexpected. But in returning again and again to the same spaces, to the same things, in again attending to them at length, for hours or days or months or weeks at a time, they begin to astonish her. They evoke amazement. And that amazement comes to be in her mind, you know, the, just the excess, the excess of being, beauty. She talks about how beauty is supposed to leave us, lead us to sublime thoughts. It has this purpose. And so, She relates it to the world of the spirit, I think primarily by way of amazement and astonishment. She is aware of her own reactions, gratitude. It's hard to be, have gratitude for a thing that is not a gift. And it's hard to have a gift if there's not a giver. And so there are all these hints, right? That there is something or someone that is benevolent toward us who has our good in mind. There is, it awakens in her a sense of her own. Uh, She talks about uh, in the poem, thirst, I wake and thirst for the goodness I do not have. You know, it awakens her own awareness of the gap, right, between what she is and what she would, the kind of person she would aspire to be. And all of that speaks to her of something other, I'm not sure if higher is the right word with Mary Oliver. Maybe she would see it as something higher as, you know, we would as Orthodox Christians, but certainly as something other. And she says at one place in another of her poems in House of Light, she talks about fish boats and how just the sheer array of shapes and sizes and compositions and such of fish skeletons she says, I don't believe for a moment that it was all blind chance because to her, what she sees is more like something that she relates it to Michelangelo or da Vinci, you know, these great artists who have this kind of exuberantly creative drive. And to her, the natural world bespeaks that, you know, something more on analogous to a great artist, the work of a great artist than the work of blind chance. And so I would say that's kind of the primary way that, as I see her poetry, her relating it to the world of the spirit. So just wondering, since she had that curiosity about God and about spirituality, how would her poetry help Christians to understand maybe something like spiritual disciplines, if we're thinking about having, you know, developing our own Spiritual discipline. Spiritual life, like that, yeah. which is what Christians should be about, right? Mm-hmm. As we understand our union with Christ, we have to have a robust spiritual life. Yeah. And whatever the limitations of, you know, Oliver's, you know, understanding or acceptance of Christianity are or were, that her life was robustly spiritual is, I think, hardly arguable. And so, you know, I think that what that tells us then is that disciplines make a difference, right? They aren't by themselves sufficient. You know, St. Bonaventure, I've been reading his itinerarium, I think, in the journey of the mind to God, and, and he talks about nature being a ladder, right? And there's like these six steps on it that, that can lead us to God. But before all of this, there is the work of grace in him, 
you know, in his, in his mind, the work of grace, it has to start the heart. But also then, without these disciplines, the mind, you know, will not be led, at least in this life, to the highest contemplation of which it's capable. But Mary Oliver, while I don't know that she necessarily developed her, what we would call spiritual disciplines in the sense of, like, taking them from a, a religious teacher or a spiritual teacher, her life manifests the reward of discipline. She talks about her, she starts every single morning of her life or started every single morning, you know, for most of her life, stepping outside with her poetry notebook, wherever she was composing at the moment, and just standing out there for a time, taking in what she saw. She made it a point, a purposeful point to spend hours quiet, away from distractions, you know, without any sort of electronic devices or often even any mechanical devices in, you know, what we would call natural spaces. And, you know, the thing about disciplines is that they are repeated, you know, activities over time. And the fact that her very yield of poetry, that it grows sort of more and more richly spiritual, I think, over the arc of her life, I think speaks to the fact that while spiritual disciplines are, I'm not saying, I wouldn't say that apart from the grace and the work of Christ, they are, you know, they're sufficient to lead us to God. But I think it does show that they nonetheless, they have an effect even on someone who is not certain about what she thinks of Christ. And this helps to show us that they are just an important part of the human spiritual life. And, you know, we are denying ourselves, I think, a, an experientially verified reality, which is that, you know, the grace of Christ, the redemptive changing grace of Christ is the starting point. It's also the ending point. It's the whole way, but, but it works with these disciplines. And when we don't practice these disciplines, we deny ourselves the chance to move into deeper and profounder joy and awareness of God and, you know, awareness of the great gift that our own being and the being of everything around us is. And so the very, just the yield of her practices speaks to the value of lifelong, gentle, not arduous, but lifelong, gentle, steady, stable spiritual disciplines. So you have talked about just how she interacted with nature. And in some of her interviews, she talked about being in nature made her the happiest. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? You said it was a little bit maybe her temperament, but do you think it was more than just her temperament that caused her to find real you know, joy? Like you said, getting up in the morning, mm -hmm. going out there with her notebook. Mm -hmm. Was it more than just temperament as she contemplated? Yes, I do. I think when I, when I speak of temperament, I just think that to me, when I read her and hear her speak, I just recognize that she had, I think, a more than normal tendency this way, more than average tendency this way, as poets are perhaps want to be. This is part of perhaps what allows them to become poets. I think I would, too, relate it to, again, her own words that the woods were a place of safety for her when she was a child. But I would say that they make her happy because they were perhaps a place where, you know, many of the particular pathologies that mark, you know, the built modern world, where she could escape them. I don't think that our, you know, the modern world is unique in having unhealthy sort of pathological habits and structures and tendencies, but it's probable that it's, 
you know, the, the form they take are, you know, peculiar to the modern world. And because so much of our lived space is cut off from the natural world, I think that she found there a respite from what otherwise would have felt very artificial to her. I guess I would go so far as to say, I think most of us, if we're emotionally and spiritually healthy, should also find the natural world that way too. It is the world as we as Christians would say, God made it. And it shouldn't be unusual that we would find it a place of peace and rest and happiness, a way that you, know, you can sort of step out of the turmoil of, of one's other life, I suppose. So I would say a good part of it was that. And, and, and I think she, the presence of God is, is everywhere, we say, as Christians. And, and Paul says that everyone can, you know, there are certain things about him that everyone can know. And I have no doubt that Mary Oliver had some sense of that. And that that sense just was especially strong for her when she was in and among what we call nature, woods, ponds, ocean, animals, plants, flowers, things like that. I think for Christians, her poetry might be informative for us and also as we interact with people who aren't Christians, as a lot of Christian non-Christians look to nature for respite. And so how does her poetry help us really understand not just the beauty of nature, but also its limitations in terms of very specifically leading us to God? And does her meditations on nature help both us and people who aren't Christians to maybe think that there is, they have a need for God? And, and how does it help us to see that we need specifically the gospel as it is revealed in Christ? Yeah, good question. To me, that question is best answered by the fact that while Oliver tends to waver between, you know, Christianity as a way to God and a radically different way, well, not even a way to God, but Lucretius, the ancient poet Lucretius. And she is as open to, and, and she meditates upon this in her poetry as well as, you know, in other places, like she is as open to Lucretius's way of accounting for human life and life in this world as she is to the Christian way, maybe more open to the Lucretian way. But what I mean by that is Lucretius basically, you know, taught that the world was a you know, things in the world, including ourselves, are the result of a random callocation of atoms. And they come together for a while, and when they come together, we have us. And when we dissolve, when those atoms dissolve, when we die, those atoms dissolve, we're gone. You know, I think that when one looks just at the natural world, I think that's a reasonable conclusion to draw. We don't see the same thing return, ever, in nature by itself. What mystifies me a little bit about the way she talks about Lucretius is that she talks about him as if she finds comfort in that idea. And yet she also talks about, she has one poem where she meditates at length on the loss of a particular oak tree that she loved. And how the idea that another oak tree will grow up and take its place is not sufficient because it was that oak tree that she loved. But if Lucretius is right, then we just pass out of being. And that's it. We're lost. We're gone, right? There's no permanence to us. And I think that Mary Oliver, you know, I think she recognized that nature could not definitively assure us that there is life after death as us, like the atoms that formed us will presumably go on to form other creatures, but we will not be there necessarily. And I think that insofar as she's an observer of nature, she's, she's right. Like, I don't think that you can derive the doctrine of the resurrection from nature. And so I do think that it helps me at least to see 
the distinct need for the revelation of Jesus Christ, because if I am going to persist after death, if the people I love you know, are going to return to me, if it's not all loss, then there has to be a recreation you know, of ourselves. There has to be a new heaven and a new earth, and in that, we have to exist as you know, bodied creatures recognizably who and what you know, we are. So I think the fact that, that Oliver, you know, as such a deep and attentive devotee of nature, the fact that she's never able to get to certainty about the next life from that shows us its limitations. And to me, that opens up my heart to what the gospel offers, which is that there is a divine intervention and that this arc that the, all of us live from life to death is not it, right? And it will be, we will be restored. So I could go on about that, but it's that particularity of the resurrection, right? It's not, the, <laughs> the resurrection is not natural. This is why, you know, I forget what the ruler was that Paul talked to about it, and he, would, he, call, he called him mad, right? He said, he said, you're mad if you think there's going to be a resurrection. And so nature leads us far, but Christ shows us what nature cannot. And so in a way, I would say I appreciate even learning from Mary Oliver's own limitations there, my own need for the revelation of Jesus Christ. And like you said, you know, as the Bible says, as we look out and we see nature, we realize that a creator exists. And I think that's a good starting point for some Christians to interact with unbelievers who are really drawn to nature. And they probably could have an interest in Mary Oliver poetry. Well, on a much lighter note, I am asking our authors if they could describe one word that they want to be true for them, maybe for their life or something that they want to do for 2023. So what would that word be for you? For my life or 2023? Yeah. Just describe <laughs> okay. what your hopes are for 2023 in one word. And not everybody has been particularly, uh, I don't know, contemplative, yeah. but it's been all kinds of different words. How about, how about just steady? <laughs> I would... I would like 2023 to be steady because the last few years have been crazy. Yes. The, there's been a lot going on in the last yeah. few years in the world. Well, thank you for being a guest again on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thank you, Melanie. It was my pleasure. You've been listening to episode 329 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Today's guest was Dr. Stephen Mitchell. He's written an online exclusive feature article for the Christian Research Journal, his article is called Christ or Lucretius, Nature and Nature's God in the poems of Mary Oliver and our subscribers can read his article for free at our website, equip.org. Anyone who would like to read his article that does not already subscribe, please go over to equip.org and click on journal. You'll see a tab there for subscription and you can subscribe to our journal for $33.50. Stay connected with the Christian Research Institute and all the new content we have coming your way. The best way to do that is to head on over to our website, equip.org. There you will find thousands of free resources right at your fingertips, from articles to video to audio, and it's all for free. You'll find our podcasts hosted there as well as the Bible Answer Man broadcast, which is hosted by CRI President Hank Canegraaff and streams live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. In addition, you don't want to miss out on subscribing to Hank Unplugged, which is the podcast of Hank Canegraaff. And in that podcast, he has really in-depth, free-flowing, essential Christian conversations with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And in addition, he has a new series on his podcast feed called Hank Unplugged Shorts, which Hank goes into the headlines in the mainstream media and refutes a lot of those cultural issues that we have in these short podcast episodes. And there's quite a few of them. You don't want to miss out on them. Now, if you want to find some of this 
at other places where it's all in one place, really subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get all of our content there, our podcasts there, and different individual questions theologically that people have that Hank answers at our YouTube channel. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know how to subscribe to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube account. Well, actually, you might just have a YouTube account. If you have a Gmail address, you have a YouTube account. Just log into YouTube with your Gmail address and search for Bible Answer Man channel, and please become one of our subscribers. In addition, if you see that bell icon right there on our front page, please click that, and every time that we have new content, you will receive a notification that new content is up on our channel for you to be able to consume. So thank you so much for the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. We are grateful for you listening and reading and watching. Mm -hmm.